I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No news! Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus. And hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe Damar, and I'm here with my incredible co-host. Rebecca Wood. Yes, and together Rebecca and I are going to craft a, a wonderful hour of radio called For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment. And we talk about it in the ways that it affects you, your wealth, your health, your happiness. The wealth and health and happiness of your friends and families and co-workers. And you're going to want to stick around for this hour because we got a really good show coming up. Uh, we're, we are going to just keep chatting for a little while. Um, and at any time, you can call in at 877-909-1007. That's 877-909-1007. And you can, uh, we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about, ecologically or environmentally related. Uh, you can also send a text anytime at 419-973-5841. Uh, we aren't going to get to those on the air, but we will get to them uh, next week if you send a text. And so after we're done chatting, we're going to have uh, our, in, our very interestingly named guest interview. It, we, I interviewed Jesse James Deer in the Water for, because uh, what happened this past week is uh, the governor of Michigan, uh, Governor Whitmer, announced that she's going to try to reopen the closed Palisades nuclear power plant. No, no, Gretchen, yeah. no. No, bad, <laughs> bad governor, yeah. bad governor of, of Michigan. Um, no biscuit. And, you know, so, so Jesse, you know, is from a group called Kraft, which is Citizens for Resistance Against Fermi II. They're based in Michigan, and they, you know, he's got quite a bit to say about this uh, horrendous decision. Uh, then we'll hear from our anti-horrendous, I guess you would say, you know, wonderful patrons and sponsors. And after that, we'll hear from Rebecca. And Rebecca, what will you be telling us about this week? Marigolds. Marigolds, all right. That's a pretty, pretty topic. And uh, then we'll have some ecological news. And as I say, we're going to hopefully hear from you at some point during this show. And Josh, there's, we got a bit of a buzz going. It's it's that yeah that's you could want to lower it just a touch that's good all right better all right so uh yeah today getting ready for the show well first of all last night i had a nice time it's wonderful weather and we went out and uh, had a nice little fire pit experience down there it's with some friends in bowling green with uh, a little too much wine but <laughs> it was a beautiful night and i you know if, if if you can get out in this weather, not too hot, not too cold, the fire's I, I had a somewhere. s'mores, which is pretty much an equally bad idea, being that I'm bad diabetic. <laughs> yeah, okay, right, s'mores. Right, so this, so we were both at, you know, outdoor fire things. Having bad ideas. Having yeah. bad ideas, doing bad <laughs> things, but, you know, but it was fun. It was really nice. It gets easier and easier to do bad things as your health declines. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as you get older and, yeah. you know. <laughs> There's fewer people to tell you no, right? And, and you, the attitude kind of gets to be kind of like, 
death gets closer. We, we have nothing to lose. We just don't care. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Old people are dangerous. Yeah, we are. <laughs> get, and get, we would get more so. But it was nice. It was fun. And, um, you know, I happened to be out with a bunch of people who are, uh, or more than half of them were like these super gardeners and, you know, Ooh, nice. master gardeners and mistress gardeners, I guess. Um, and so I was asking about planting uh, peas because, uh, you know, I know you can plant peas in the fall, you know, once the summer heat is gone. And they were like, it's too late. You've kind of missed it. But you know what? I'm going to do it anyway because I feel like this fall it's going to be another one of those where there's not going to be any frost until we're like into December just because things have gotten so hot around the planet. So I'm going to go ahead as an experiment. I'm going to plant peas this weekend and I'll let you folks know how that goes. And that uh, segues into a tweet that we got last week that I, I want to respond to this week. Uh, we had a listener tweet, should we plant more trees or should we just let nature take its course? And the answer is uh, both. And you know, we've, we have cut down so many trees that the forests are gonna have trouble regenerating in a lot of places because we've removed the, you know, the overstory, you know, there's been erosion. And so it, especially in places like that, we need to plant. We need to plant, but what we need to make sure we're doing is we're planting native species and we're planting a mix of native species, copying the way nature would do it on its own. Because uh, if these, there's a lot of plans to just do these, you know, millions of acres and like one kind of tree and you just disperse the same sort of tree or seeds using robots or seedlings using robots and you make these big monoculture forests. Uh, no, we should not do that. But we should, like I say, we should plant a mix of trees. We should try to copy nature as best we can. Also, and, places without trees are hot and unpleasant. Yeah. Yeah. So... So we definitely have to take a hand. Your neighborhood will get gross without trees. True. And we have to take a hand in the healing because we definitely had a, a hand in the in the destruction of it. Neighbors. And part of what happened with that uh, destruction, you may have noticed this past week that you were sneezing a little more, sniffling a little more, your eyes might have been watering. Uh, some of that is, is natural in the fall because we have the situation where the leaves start dying and then there's more spores of things like molds and stuff that are decomposing those leaves. So part of that is natural, but part of it was this past week, uh, smoke from the Western wild wildfires. Uh, I saw satellite imagery and uh, it was just very clear. It was just this huge cloud of smoke coming out of the West and coming right across the country and right swirling right around us. So, um, so if you've been wondering, you know, what's going on? You know, maybe I tested negative for COVID, but I'm sneezing like crazy. Part of it is this this particulate matter that's that's around all of us right now. The, the news is all, oh, it's going to make the sunset so pretty. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would settle for not so pretty sunsets and nice cool temperatures, but yeah. but we don't get that, that choice right now. So, um, but, it is fall, as I said, and uh, you know, when I woke up at six o'clock this morning, it was dark for the first time, and I was mm -hmm. like, oh man, it's coming. Uh, but in fact, it's coming on Thursday. Thursday the 22nd is the first day, official day of fall. And I don't know about you, but this still feels kind of like August to me, doesn't it? it I mean, this, Basically. this doesn't really feel like fall. I remember, I remember when I was a kid, you know, you'd be thinking frost in September. You know, it, it would be getting cold enough right about now that you might have a, a frost here and there. But uh, well, for a minute, it seemed like it was going to be a very early and very cold fall. But then, you know, it went the other way again, because that's kind of what happens with the climate change is that things seesaw around wildly with yeah. no apparent pattern. That's right. Patterns are good. We need patterns. Yeah, that's that's why some people call it call it climate change, although we've never called it. You know, we don't call it just climate change. We call it global warming. It is overall trending because towards overall warmth. Treads towards Not warmth, in a good but, way. <laughs> but with plenty of freak snowstorms thrown in there just for spice, I there guess. There you go, yep. Yeah. So, um, but this fear, you know, pretty much everybody now has realized, yes, it's happening. Uh, no more point in denying it. And so the politicians are using this fear 
that of global warming to push on us the, the terrible non-solution of nuclear power. And what happened, like I said, with uh, Governor Whitmer, when a nuclear power plant closes, I allow myself a day of unbridled joy. Okay, I'm like, Yay, it, it, it happened with Palisades. It's like Palisades closed. And an angel gets its wings. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing, I allow nothing to get me down for 24 blissful hours. But now, but Whitmer is like trying to take that back. You know, she's trying to reopen a closed plant, which uh, this plant and Diablo Canyon, those two plants should have closed long ago because you know this plant was operating on the edge of disaster for I'm guessing there was a reason years. it got closed down. There's you know, a, there's it wasn't a bunch just because, oh, we yeah. don't like nuke plants. There was something specifically wrong with that plant. Exactly, and we're going to hear about that now uh, in our interview with Jesse James Deer in the Water because um, the company that owned it actually shut it down early, you know, they because it was falling apart and, and ready to blow. Uh, but this, but now Grand, but now Whitmer, along with, um, you know, with Holtec, thinks that they sh can reopen it, which is just insane. And we'll, we'll hear about just about how insane that is right now. So go ahead, Josh. Let's hear the interview with Jesse James Deer in the Water. Okay, Jesse James Deer in the Water. Thanks so much for coming back to For a Green Future. Could you please uh, tell everybody? You know, say your name again and tell everybody who you're with. Yeah, uh, my name is Jesse James Deer and Water. Uh, I'm community organizer uh, with Citizens Resistance at Fermi Two Craft. Uh, we opposed the operation of the Fermi Two power plant. We would like to see it closed. The energy produced by it be produced by renewable resources. Uh, the plant also be safely decommissioned and all waste be secured that's on the Great Lakes. All right, a worthy goal. And, uh, we, you know, we'd, we'd like to be able to support you any way we can in, in that. Uh, but uh, the re reason I asked you on today, this week, is because of the bombshell that uh, Governor Whitmer dropped last week. Uh, this, this, this decision to try to keep uh, the Palisades nuclear plant, or try to reopen the closed Palisades plant. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there? You know, it, it, it was a it's still a big issue and it was really on the forefront of a lot of our uh minds uh here back uh during the summertime whenever uh the the, the civilian nuclear credits went through from the for the Department of Energy to prop up uh uneconomic, degrading and failing aging reactors. And this year and in June, uh Holtec uh, applied for funding for these credits and uh, it was actually uh, uh, the application uh, they turned it in a few weeks after Palisades, af after Intergy closed Palisades and transferred the ownership to Holtec uh, and so right now uh, Governor Whitmer uh, has, riddle, has wrote a letter to uh, Granholm, to uh, Jennifer Granholm, basically, you know, saying Palisades is a top priority for Michigan. We hope that Holtec can reopen the Palisades uh, to use the, the credits, uh, you know, and, and just goes into a whole bunch of different things. And so the bombshell was that it sounded like Palisades was going to get opened back up because there was a couple articles that came out uh, but upon further uh, investigation and further searching and, and looking at more information, there's several moving parts, uh, uh, as one article had stated. Uh, and these moving parts are that uh, Palisades, the site is owned by Holtec. They have put in for the civil nuclear credits, uh, but they still are requiring a third party to come in and do the repairs on the plant. And so it feels like Holtec is actually and could be just applying for this money and these funds so that they can uh, keep 
the site open and active uh, to potentially bring in more advanced and small modular reactors, as they say, uh, because that was another thing that they had mentioned before was uh, Palisades being a potential site for their new uh, their new small modular nuclear reactor. So, I mean, kind of like where we are is that the plant's closed. There is funding to keep it open and do the repairs that are required of it because it is in bad shape. We know that much. Uh, but Holtec doesn't want to uh, uh, Holtec doesn't want to be the ones to be responsible for that. So yeah, the um, when you say it's in bad shape, I mean literally there were seals leaking, right? They're, they're, they were kind of holding it together with with duct tape, and, <laughs> and in fact they they, yeah. they closed it early, didn't they? Because that there was yes. so much was going wrong, and it was you know it was it's also one of the most embrittled plants in the country, so that if something did go wrong and they had to use emergency cooling, the thing could well have just shattered and blown up. Yeah, and uh, for the folks that don't know much about embrittlement, uh, I recently had a lesson, not recently, in the past couple of years, had a real good lesson in it, and uh, mainly to do with spent fuel ponds. But, you know, uh, uh, embrittlement is uh, like the wear and the tear and the heat and the stress on the uh, components, you know, like the metals and different stuff like that that are uh, supposed to keep the integrity, you know, the structural, the strength of the plant, you know, hold hold it together and the embrittlement uh, uh, makes it weaker and uh, more, success, more susceptible to cracks and breaking and falling apart and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now that the letter from Whitmer makes it sound like they're, you know, the, the plan is or the, what the, she wants to do is reopen and restart. I mean, she talks in there about yes. how many megawatts it, it produces and how many jobs it creates and, yep. and, and you know. Yeah. So maybe Holtec's playing, you know, a, a shell game there, but, but maybe it isn't. Maybe, they're, maybe they yeah. are thinking of just reopening. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so as far as it goes with the third party, uh, I kind of feel like that was the same scenario that they were in before and some of the reporting that was done uh, whenever this, you know what I mean, was hot there a, a few months ago uh, was that they needed that third party. And so it still feels like that there's, yeah, that there's a chance that uh, someone could step in if they can make a bunch of money or something like that. But uh, yeah, so, 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 in, in, in my mind, it's 50 50 shell game, uh, whole text just trying to hold on to place and space and face to bring in the new reactors, the small modular reactors, or they're just really are letting Michigan have a chance at keeping it reopened. But Michigan has to find the third party. Uh huh. Now, Jennifer Granholm wasn't so, was she this? nuclear crazy when she was governor you know now she's uh, you know secretary of department of energy but was she that crazy when she was governor of michigan i thought she made kind of made her reputation promoting wind and solar in michigan yeah see so that's uh you know i i'm not a lifelong michigander you know what i mean i'm a citizen of the cherokee nation of oklahoma i come from a deep community there and uh but i've been back in michigan now for like six or seven years and so i wasn't here to experience that but from what i hear yeah she was like a champion and an advocate for renewables uh so i mean maybe there was something that people missed back in the day because she was such a champion for renewables and people overlooked some things or uh, she was, you know, uh, a pro nuclear back then too, but it just wasn't an issue that she had to speak on then. Uh huh. So, well, but, but go ahead. Oh, I was going to say now, yeah, they're they're full on nuclear, full full blown, and it's really sad because uh, Governor Whitmer, you know what I mean, uh, is playing to her, and uh, you know, and so that's kind of like making some of our important Michigan people play to that hand too like Whitmer uh, Stabenow and Peters even though they've already played that hand anyway but yeah 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's part of the the whole turning the de Democratic Party into nuclear zombies. I mean, we saw that yeah. last we saw that last week in uh, California, where that they they voted to keep the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant open. You know, to give 1.6 billion dollars of uh, California taxpayer money to keep that plant open, even though that's literally since it sits on an earthquake fault, <laughs> one of the most dangerous nuclear plants in the in the world. Um, yeah, and uh, the other the other thing about this, I mean, this is Holtec, and and Holtec is is horrible, right? I mean, they have a, a terrible history. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, a bad track record. Uh, yeah, uh, a bad track record. Uh, bad dealings. Uh, that, yeah, yeah. There, there's lots of different issues. Uh, uh, well, one of the things is uh, uh, the fear that they might try to do a monopoly on the decommissioning and uh, the radioactive waste transports uh, because they're getting because they're the ones that are currently uh involved in trying to get this interim storage going on down in the texas new mexico area and so like yeah i, I mean uh we already know you know that it's there that they have all these different shady dealings you know there's a paper trail of it uh uh we uh yeah and uh, the, the fear is that they'll get all these plants to do the decommissioning, do a crappy job on the decommissioning, uh, rush the waste off to some place, uh, and get all the government contracts for the transport on the sites, on the decommissioning sites, potentially set up their new reactors at all these decommissioning sites, and become the owner of the nuclear industry, pretty much, in a sense, you know. Uh, so that's a fear too, especially because Holtec has this paper trail and this uh, thing for being like a kind of like a shady company. Yeah, I mean, if you if you Google uh, Holtec finds, you know, you know, pages and pages of, of Google searches come up. I mean, they get fi they've got fined for for paying off essentially a, a Tennessee Valley Authority uh, employee and not telling the NRC about it and. And now the big thing, one of the biggest controversies with Holtec is they want to dump a million gallons of uh, water from the Pilgrim nuclear power plant, which is decommissioning. Uh, they want to just dump it into the bay or in Boston, you know, into Boston Harbor. And, yeah. And, you know, that's, <laughs> that's just insane. And so, you know, I, I'm a little surprised that Governor Whitmer, Whitmer would get into bed with an organization like that one. It's It's really... Yeah, yeah, and then shady. praise them like like she's doing in that letter, like like I don't know, it, it, it's uh, 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 it's it's pretty wild, and uh, we've kind of been here at Craft, we've kind of been uh, in conversation in the past few years, a couple of years with a, a person who is a retired NRC safety inspector, uh, and it's it, it's okay for me to say this because we quoted him in the newsletter, which folks can catch coming out next month. Uh, he says that uh, the Whitmer administration has chosen climate over current safety for the people by opening Palisades back up, if they do. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and it, that's a choice you don't have to make. I mean, you just no. – you, you could just keep going with the wind and the solar – and when you think about it, you know, freaking uh, the uh, and a lot. This is the things that people aren't really taking into consideration uh, uh, when they talk about global warming and climate change and things being thrown out of balance. You know, the nukes aren't just this radioactive waste that uh, is going to sit for a couple hundred thousand years. That's super freaking deadly. You know, uh, uh, in the mining, you, you know, in the plants and the tritium. You know, and all this stuff. It. It's uh, not just that, you know, there, there's also the man-made heat that's being put into our earth and our atmosphere from the core of, you, you know, at the cores of these reactors that are going off at who knows what temperature, you, you know, they have to displace, like uh, use and displace, like uh, use and replace like 45 million gallons of water a day uh, uh, just to keep it cool. And then, you know, and they're putting all that back out 
into the water, but then there's also the heat that's coming from the stacks, and then there's the heat that's left at the core. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. It, it even even that water vapor that the sta that you know cooling towers put out, even that is actually a greenhouse gas. Uh, it, it, it doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long as CO2. It only stays in the atmosphere for about two weeks. But during that two weeks, it's it's like ten times as potent as as if those as if they were putting out pure CO2 into the atmosphere. So, so yeah, nukes are not a, a climate solution at all. So, all right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, Chris, how's how's the battle against Furby coming? How are, how are what's any new developments on that front? You know, it's tough. You know, we're 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 in, we're, we're here deep in you know uh, DTEs planted deep in it. Uh, you know, you, you see you see what the uh, uh, governor's saying about nuclear. You know, so you can kind of imagine what we're going up against and and what we're looking at. Uh, some of the big news here: uh, they put in for their uh, dumping permit uh, back in I think it was April. And uh, they're supposed to only have like six months or something like that to find out. Of, or no, no, not six months. Uh, there's like a it's a 180 day process, but uh, uh, the 180 day process has been pushed back like six months or something like that. So uh, we figure there's something going on with the permit. And you know, as always, we would probably comment on it or do what we can around it but uh we don't really know what's going on with it so we can't <laughs> we can't uh we can't get any we're not getting any information so like uh you know that's that, that that's one thing there we're hoping that maybe they're behind on some stuff or whatever or on their permit you know which won't get firmly closed but hopefully we'll change the, uh some some pollution limits or something and uh, uh Let's see here. Other big news on the Fermi front: uh, the Mayfly struck again. Uh, they uh, <laughs> uh, arced the transformer, or like they hatched off the lake. Here, it just happened a couple years ago. They hatched off the lake and landed on the transformers, and it uh, blew the power out, all the power to Fermi itself, and so they had to shut it down. That happened again last month. Oh wow! Yeah, yay Mayflies! Wow. <laughs> Yeah, 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 Mayflies is right. They're freaking, uh, uh, you know, exposing it for what it is, you know, its weaknesses and everything. Uh, yeah. If it could be yeah, shut down by bugs, it's not what you'd call a, a robust energy source. Yeah, man. <laughs> but if you could just oh, sorry. remind people of, uh, you know, how they could uh, follow craft and, and how they could see, you know, keep up with you folks. Yeah, uh, uh, you can go to our website at shutdownfermi.org and sign up for the newsletter. And we also have a couple of uh, uh, action letters uh, that folks can, you know, uh, submit. And then there's also our uh, Facebook group, Craft, uh, which is really good because that's the that's where folks can get day to day information. You know what I mean? It moves a lot faster. Yeah. Thanks. So. Thanks so much. Um, so now we're going to hear from our wonderful advertisers and patrons. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, just a, a note: uh, some of our patrons. It turns out that Patreon has dumped a bunch of them without telling either them or me. I just discovered this when I went back through my account. So uh, if you're a regular patron and you're, you've noticed that <laughs> Patreon has stopped taking your money, you might have to go back in and, and re-up re as a patron. So uh, so thanks for doing that. But in terms of advertisers, uh, the Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead people on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past the sunset every day of the year. And there's several ways to get a hold of them. One is to call them at 419-353-1897. That's 419-353-1897. You can also go to their website, which is wcparks.org. Very nice website full of pretty pictures. 
and uh, they have an app that you can download. Go to any app store, search for WC Parks. And they also have a, a, a huge presence on social media, so you can look for them on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all such virtual places. So that's the Wood County Park District. And as I mentioned before, we're also brought to you by our patrons. And they are wonderful people who've gone to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and they searched for For a Green Future, up popped our Patreon page, and they would scroll through and decided which level of membership to join up at. And so every month a little bit comes out of their account, so it comes over to us, and that's how we can afford to stay on the air. And I especially want to thank my Patreon patrons this week because uh, a lot of them are showing amazing persistence in trying to overcome, you know, getting kicked off for no apparent reason. And uh, we're, we're working on it. And they're, they're, you know, thanks so much for, for keeping us on the air. All right. And because one of the things that we do with this airtime that we have is uh, Rebecca tries to bring us a little interesting tidbit about the natural world every week. Uh, Rebecca, what will we be talking about this week? Okay, well, uh, this week, this month is, is once again Hispanic Heritage Month, which I realized about three quarters of the way through it <laughs> because I'm not the most alert person in the world. Um, and right now, well, to, to your credit, I think it officially doesn't start till the fifteenth. Oh, it's, okay. It's an odd month, an odd a heritage month it goes from the 15th to the 15th for some reason okay that's confusing <laughs> yeah it is. it is but anyway right now at the new york botanical garden there is an exhibit of um plants associated with frida Kahlo. mostly i think from her garden at the casa azul she she had a really apparently large impressive garden including she had old man cactus and a couple of other you know sentimental plants that had to do with the native culture that she liked, Aztec and, uh, and Mayan culture. And uh, one of those was marigolds. Um, hmm. I don't think they featured in her painting, although some other elephant, she liked elephant ears and, and old man cactus a lot. But uh, they're, they're really significant because they're connected with the Day of the Dead festival. Um, hmm. Tagetes is the genus, let's see, uh, most marigolds I think are from the genus Tagetes. I don't know how to say it, from the family Estertiae, which is daisies. It's, it's considered to be the daisy family. Okay. Uh, they're native to the Americas, uh, from the southwest U.S. to South America, although they've been naturalized many other places uh, or are grown as seasonal flowers. And uh, there's one of them, Targetes minuta, which is invasive in some areas, it's considered a noxious weed, apparently. And uh, getting, getting in on Eldia uh, early here because the Dia de, de los Muertes happens on uh, November 1st and 2nd, right kind of after Halloween, which it started out as the traditional North European harvest festival, so the celebration of the ancestors. Um, and the marigolds are really important uh, to Eldia, uh, to creating the altars and cemeteries or in, in homes. Um, apparently, the, the bright color and the strong smell is supposed to guide the spirits uh, to, to your altar to come visit you. And also, they represent the fragility of life because, you know, they're flowers. Um, some of the most, one of the most traditional ones to use is uh, Targetes erecta or the Mexican marigold or also the Aztec marigold, which in Nahuatl is called Simpasuchitl. You'll notice uh, the flower of the dead, literally. Zuchitl is like the uh, the name Zuchitl, which is a, a popular name among little girls uh, to celebrate Mexican heritage. And also, uh, we, we've talked about poinsettias before, which are called poop flowers, quite low Zuchitl. So we're, we're learning some Nahuatl here. <laughs> okay. That's what we call our dog now. It, it suits his personality, a little poop flower. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they, they grow uh, they grow very well in the wild, especially in the states of Puebla and Veracruz in Mexico. And they're sacred to the goddess, I'm going to try this, Mictexihuatl, the goddess of the who guards the bones of the dead in, uh, in Aztec culture. And uh, right, the Aztecs view them as a sacred flower, so they cultivated them to make bigger, bigger prettier blossoms. Um, they're grown all over the world now, which is why we have French French marigolds and also African marigolds. And it's confusing because sometimes the Mexican marigold is called the African marigold because it's traveled <laughs> back and forth. 
Uh, they're edible flowers. Um, the Aztecs believes that they cured hiccups, healed light, the lightning struck, and uh, helped you cross water safely. Interesting. Wow. So I don't know whether they do those things or not, but they're not going to hurt. You know, you're going on a little boat trip. You have some marigolds on your salad. Why, what's sure. it going to? You know, what's what's the problem? Definitely add some color to it. For sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Spanish, oh, oh then they're good in gardens too. They they ward off some pests, I guess, especially pests like tomatoes. I've heard. Yeah, they're a good companion plant to to scare off bugs. Right. So yeah, a little 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 something in your uh, your garden just for fancy. And the Spanish took the seeds back and cultivated them in France and Africa right around the 1500s. It started out in monastery gardens and spread out and got popular. Uh, you can also use paper marigolds in your, your altar, although that's not going to, you know, if your ancestors are a little slow, you might want to give them the smell too, I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah, put a few drops of perfume on there maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure what you're supposed to do if your many of your ancestors were mean as snakes. I, I struggle with that personally. <laughs> um, according to like the person, one of the pers- persons who was interviewed for the article, they're using miracles is not offensive. Like doing things like white people really should not do, like painting their faces with a skeleton and dressing up as the Katarina character with a big hat and the hoop skirts, a skeleton girl. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's a relatively inoffensive inafor- form of cultural appropriation. It's okay. I don't. I think this person might have been a florist, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. right. at least yeah. buy him from a Hispanic person if you can. I don't know. They also symbol the uh, the the life giving power of the sun. And also, I wanted to, to, to use. I I feel bad about not doing this for everyone I know who's had babies, but. I wanted to, it, since it sort of ties in, I'm going to you know, use this to, as an opportunity to welcome the, the spirit of little Reina Zochitl Vieira to the world, which just happened like this week or last oh. week. Oh, that's nice. Congratulations. Yes. On that. Flower queen. Her name means flower queen. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you on that. Um, so if you have any comments on, on marigolds, uh, love them or hate them, uh, either one, we'll talk to you at 877-909-1007 or any comment on anything we've talked about so far or any comment on anything you'd like to talk about in terms of ecology and the environment. We are ready and waiting by the phone here. Josh is like poised over the buttons. So, well, kind of. All right. Um, now on to ecological news. And we do have quite a bit of it, but we got some time. We should be able to get through it. Uh, first biggest story utilities new um turns out there's a story in the atlantic uh, published uh, september 7th title was it wasn't just oil spreading denial Uh, and what what happened is they've uncovered a whole bunch of uh, corporate communications saying that they knew the utility companies the power companies municipal utilities and the companies like first energy and and all those uh, knew global warming was here, knew, knew that it was uh, caused by humans, and made a conscious decision to uh, to deny it. Uh, and in fact, what happened is that there's two of the biggest utility company lobbyists, which since utility companies are one of the most powerful lobbies in local, state, and federal government, uh, one is called the Electric Power Research Institute, the other is called the Edison Electric Institute, and both of those, uh, starting around uh, 1988, consciously did this, joined in with the oil companies, because the oil companies were already going full blast on climate denial. Uh, but around 1988, the, the utility companies joined them, and they started putting out press releases saying things like, uh, you know, climate change will lead to cooler days, warmer nights, and better vegetables. <laughs> For a minute, <laughs> before, before yeah. it's like the it's like the manic phase of being bipolar. It's fun for a minute. Yeah, well, and then very bad things start to happen. I know. I, people are telling me, you know, hey, I had a guy tell me once, I just wanted just warm enough fear for alligators. That's all. Uh, I'm like, no, why alligators? No. Yeah, just, this is not one of the n- things that you want that associated with warm climate. You know, that's I can think of things, but that's yeah. not one of them. No, no. So, <laughs> I don't want alligators. Trust me. I have we, a small dog. We are better off with some frost. You know, killing killing yeah. the bugs and the and the parasites and all that stuff. 
Uh, I mean, this is why we're up in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and so what happened in 1988, uh, NASA, basically that's when NASA told all these utility companies in a presentation, yes, it's global warming, yes, it's caused by humans, and your coal plants are, and your gas plants are, are uh, doing it. And that's when the utility companies created something called the Global Climate Coalition, uh, and that existed in order to uh, promote continued doubt about carbon dioxide and, and global warming. So all you climate deniers, this is where you got those ideas. They were being deliberately planted by a bunch of people who knew better and, and made a conscious decision to try to convince you that global warming wasn't real. Uh, back in 88 was when they started, and then 1992, that's when uh, based on what they were saying, the U.S. didn't join the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, so what's hap what happens these days is legislatures, legislators turn towards these corporate lobbyists for advice and direction. And the corporate lobbyists are the ones that are least trustworthy about these things because their companies invested money, billions, that they still haven't paid off in these coal plants and these gas plants. And so they're, you know, the Greeks do that you don't trust the people who stand to make a personal profit from a something. You don't trust their arguments. <laughs> Those people are not trustworthy, but uh, that's what that's what's happened. Good and tips. so this uh, story in the Atlantic Hello. is talking about a peer-reviewed article that was published in uh, the Environmental yeah, Research yeah, Letters. We'll so it's all been peer-reviewed. Uh, and well, I just want to note that we'll Alec, the, the American Legislative Committee, is still yeah. promoting climate denial. So uh, they, even though everybody knows better, they have not stopped. And before we go on to our next story, we have a caller. Caller, go ahead. Hi, um, I wanted to share that I was in uh, camping uh, on Lake Michigan um, last weekend. It's um, Pentwater, which is a little tourist town now, but it was 100 20 years ago, it was a like uh, a logging uh, concern. Or there were like these huge mills and all that, but mm -hmm. they logged out all the trees. And then, uh, then two, so most people left. But now it's it's pretty beautiful around there. But I mean, I'm sure it's not the growth that nature prefers exactly. But at least it's kind of encouraging that once the humans got out of there, it uh, sort of recovered its it's natural state and you know everything is really beautiful so just yeah. wanted to share that yeah no definitely in places where the forest is regenerating itself there we don't go in we don't mess with anything in those in those places and most of the time the forest knows how to regenerate itself and part of the problem when we go in and try to reforest we have a tendency to like use herbicides and things to discourage the trees we don't like and we just sort of mess things up more. What was the name of the, the place again? It's called Pentwater. P E N T W A T E R. It's um Pentwater. It, it, um, is that it's a, a little northwest we I mean west northwest from here. It'd be like Lovington area. Uh, so it's about halfway up in the state of Michigan, I guess. Is that a state park Lake or? Michigan. Yeah, there's a state park there. It's called uh, Charles Mears. State Park, um, and it's quite nice. Um, that uh, it's all sandy and around there and bald, you know. Yeah. Very nice beach and all that stuff, but um, I was more interested from the aspect of what the uh, history uh, of the of the area had been and all all the uh, you know what what impact. I understand the whole of almost the whole whole of the northern state of New York had that same thing happen. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the Adirondacks. Completely, yeah. They, the Adirondacks, which was a huge region, was literally cut to the ground to provide charcoal for New York City. And so <laughs> after all the trees were gone, the state created the Adirondack Park Reserve. And when they were when they created it, it was literally nothing but a field of stumps. And and then they prohibited logging after after they had cut all the trees down. 
And but over the course of 100 years, 150 years now, uh, it has come back and it is one of the most literally one of the most beautiful places in the world. So yeah, nature will come back as long as we stop destroying it. So, so all right, well, thanks so much for the call. Okay, bye. Yeah, that's uh, lumbering is what brought the woods down from Canada. Mm -hmm. And also the, the town where my mother was born, uh, Muskegon, the hospital there is named after Hackley, the Hackley family who are sort of, they're lumber barons and they're sort of like the local low rent Carnegie's of, of Muskegon. <laughs> they got the Hackley Hospital, the Hackley Museum, the Hackley House where you could go and tour. Uh -huh. So the woods, as in Rebecca Wood woods, yeah. were, were involved in, in lumbering. And it, yeah, it attracts dangerous weirdos from Canada lumbering bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just remember that, folks. <laughs> All right, on to our next story. And this one uh, is that uh, there was a legal victory against Enbridge, which is always fun. Uh, Enbridge, as you know, they put Line 3 through Native American territory. Uh, we've, we had people on last year who were getting arrested protesting that pipeline which started carrying oil last October. It's been almost a year and it's had several leaks just as predicted and it's destroyed, you know, destroyed aquifers, you know, all the bad stuff people said would happen that was denied in all the environmental reviews. Those things have actually happened. But uh, one of the things that was, that was going on is that in uh, 2021, Hubbard County uh, blocked a road that led to a piece of private property that Winona LaDuke had bought for the purpose of having protests on it to protest the pipeline, which was nearby. So she had her own land. She bought it with her own money and she was using the county road to, to drive to it. And then people would, they'd have protests there. And Hubbard County said, uh, you know what? We're not even gonna let people on the road. And so they blockaded the road and anybody who tried to drive on it got arrested. Uh, there were 800 arrests. And uh, so they went to court and the court just sided with Winona to do to some degree. It said, you know, you, you can't, if someone's using a, a road to go to their own private property to have their own, uh, you know, private protest, you can't arrest them for doing that. And that would seem to make some sense. Uh, but it was a little bit of a, of a pyrrhic victory because the judge voided the citations for Winona LaDuke and the woman that she co-owns the property with, uh, voided them for those two, but refused to void it for any of the other um, protesters claiming that they didn't have jurisdiction. And also Winona had asked for uh, restitution of legal fees because you know, she was forced to fight this, this obviously undemocratic, obvious violation of the constitution, which guarantees the right to assemble. Uh, she had to fight that in court and hire her own lawyers. And so she asked for legal expenses and the judge denied that too. Well, isn't it, there's some kind of a law that like, if you buy a property that isn't connected to a road, your neighbors have to let, like, let you dr drive down there to make, make a road through their property to get to the road. Or they something? don't have to, they don't have to let you, but you can negotiate an easement with right them. away. Yeah. And yeah. Winona, and she did that. She had a negotiated easement right. when she bought the property. So she had every legal right to drive on the county road across county property to go to her parcel and uh, the sheriff of Hubbard County violated that right so the judge agreed um, there was another little bit of a victory uh, against Enbridge so Enbridge had two big legal losses uh, and that is the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Chippewa uh, also in terms of this pipeline the Enbridge uh, well this is Enbridge line 5 actually um, the, the company went right through their reservation without getting any kind of permission or without paying them any kind of rent or restitution or just, they just were like, Hey, we're building a pipeline. We can go wherever we want. And a judge has finally said to said, no, you can't do that. Um, it took a, took five years to, to get this. And so the judge has said to Enbridge, you're going to have to reroute. And Enbridge is like, oh sure. We'll reroute. Cause they love building pipelines. So yeah. they're, they're going to have to build a pipeline going around the, the um, reservation 
and then they'll turn off the one that's going through. But the judge also said, in the meantime, you don't need to turn off the pipeline. You can keep making your money. Oh. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. Let's reward them for breaking the law. Yeah, so they're going to keep making more than enough money. But apparently they're going to do some negotiating and maybe have to pay some rent for the time that they were illegally crossing the, you know. and Yeah, and uncool. So, yeah, no. It's, Seriously. And so that that's so it's a 40-mile reroute. So there'll be more pipeline, but... Uh -huh. But it was a victory for the for the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Chippewa because it, 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 it legally said, guess what? People can't trespass on your land to build pipelines without any kind of restitution or negotiation. So so that was good. Uh, now, so now I want to balance all that, you know, semi-good legal news with some uh, unbridled fun news. One is that, that they've discovered in Delaware they discovered a, a mature American chestnut tree uh, that does not have the chestnut blight mm -hmm. that's producing uh, producing healthy chestnuts. And so they're going to take those and plant them all over Delaware now. Excellent. And uh, it's possible that if this tree is resistant and not just incredibly lucky, that it may survive the blight and uh, we may they may be able to repopulate Delaware with American you chestnuts. Can have chestnuts again. Yeah. And uh, there were over 4 billion chestnuts. It was the most common tree in the eastern forest. And it's been gone for about 100 years now. So it'd be wonderful if this tree does turn out to be uh, a pure. And they did genetic testing. This is a pure American chestnut. Sometimes hybrids of American and Chinese appear. But this is a pure American chestnut. So hopefully uh, that will work out. We'll know in the coming years. Uh, let's see here. Um, in the EU, uh, as we've talked about before, they had a, a big battle over the uh, green taxonomy, that is uh, the definition of clean energy or green energy, and they decided to include two of the dirtiest energies ever created, uh, gas, natural gas and nuclear, in there. And so what finally happened is the NGOs that were uh, part of the EU platform on sustainable finance which is a, a group that included environmental organizations and industry organizations uh, to decide, to, you know, to advise on this question. Uh, all the, the NGOs have walked out. They've all quit the, the green finance group. Uh, and that includes like the European consumer organizations, uh, includes uh, an organization called Transport and Environment, uh, Bird Life, the Environmental Coalition on, on Standards, Trans another group called Transport the Environment, the World Wildlife Fund, they all walked out because they were, they're saying the EU picked politics, the EU picked political donations over science, and the science was clear, neither nukes nor natural gas are green energy. Not hardly. Right, and so they're like, so our, our, our participation in this is, is worthless, and, and the EU's taxonomy, the definition that they came up with for green energy is also worthless. So, uh, so good on them, you know, because you somebody don't, needed to say something. Yeah, I mean, you, there is a point at which continued participation isn't. Oh, maybe we can influence the system from the inside. Continued participation is just giving that that corrupt corruption a you know a veneer of respectability. So, they took that veneer away, and the EU is kind of stinging from that. But uh, and speaking of compromise, this is this is a fun one. Uh, Rebecca, what is the story that just keeps on giving and refuses to stop, like, giving us ammunition? Oh, no, not House Bill 6 It is. Again. It's another House Bill 6 update. <laughs> the zombie bill. Oh, yes. my God. Uh, no, no. The, the uh, First Energy, the CEO, uh, just got replaced. Uh, his name was uh, Steve, oh, I, I can't read my own writing here, Straw. Mm. Maybe somebody could check that. Who who is the? If you, Josh, would you mind going on the internet? No, don't try to read my writing. If I can't do it, no one. <laughs> uh, just see who who was what was the name of the CEO that resigned? Uh, he took he had taken over from Chuck Jones, who got uh, fired in 2020 for his participation in the House Bill Six bribery scandal, and he he it turns out he was the guy who actually signed all the checks, all the bribe checks. Oh yeah. And you know you know he, maybe he shouldn't have written bribe in the memo. You know yeah. that might have that might have 
Yeah, Steven Straub, S T R A H. So he got installed as CEO when he took over from the corrupt Chuck Jones in 2020. And he said, in his, in his speech accepting it, he said, I am fostering a culture of uncompromising integrity and ethical behavior. And uh, I realized that if you have no integrity and no ethics, you don't have to compromise. Right? True, yeah. yeah. I mean, you only have to compromise. You're following if, your own ethical standards. Right. You just don't have any. Exactly. So, <laughs> so, right. It must be very liberating not yes. to have any integrity or ethics. Um, but so, so what happened is this past week, uh, the group Energy and Policy came out with the reporting. They actually are the ones who went to the FBI files and found his signature on the bribe checks. And that was repeated by Clean Tech Facts. And all this was on Twitter. This never even made the mainstream media, but it was enough that uh, First Energy demanded his resignation, and he's gone. So that's some, bye good, bye. that's some good news. Bye-bye, Chucky. All right. Well, and unfortunately, we have to leave, too, because we've reached the end of the show. But thanks so much for listening. This is Joe Damar. And Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. I don't want no oil, a spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things, a creeping and crawling. Won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Son, don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No, no.